Chapter 5, Recording Number 1, Otten, Friday, August 30th, 1991, 7.48 a.m., Year 5, Day 14. Friday, August 30th, 1991, Communism Fall? Dear ones, hold up. Otten here to point out some most uncomfortable truths. I remind you that in the Soviet Union, nothing is as it's being given to you. Worse, communism is not. Russia, nor the Soviet Union, have ever had communism. To dissolve the Communist Party means nothing except that the Soviets have moved into a totally democratic dictatorship. Moreover, the one who expected to be a dictator is not. Democracy can only work when there are honorable choices. A vote means less than nothing if there is only one thing to vote for. Further, the show of the Soviet nations pulling away is exactly that, a show. It is simply a phase, now, of divide and conquer. Again, I remind you to listen. What is Cheney telling you about defense budgets? For one thing, the Russians still spend a massive amount on weapons and show no signs of lessening that amount, but rather fully intend to continue to fool yourselves, oh, fully intend to up it as soon as the outside from you aid begins to flow. If you continue to fool yourselves, you are in serious trouble. Why do you think the Prime Minister of Great Britain is visiting the vacation home of Bush? Worse, the Queen didn't even bother to come herself. A little secret. The elite all have to stay on the better side of Great Britain. For the holes for safety are in New Zealand and Australia. The full intent is that the Northern Hemisphere will be radioactive one way or another. Please attach the Radiation Hazard USA sheet and the fallout patterns to this document. See Map 1 and 2. Now for truth in presentation. A U.S. Supreme Court statement was made regarding the lying and manipulation compiled from proven findings and written up as a portion of the American Communications Association versus Dowds, 339 U.S. 382-442. Let me quote. In a 1986 New York Times CBS News poll survey of 2016 adults about incidents of the White House lying to the American public, only I... Only 1% of those surveyed thought that the administration told the truth all the time. 53% said the administration told the truth only some of the time, while 9% said it hardly ever told the truth. Americans should question now whether the current administration under a former CIA director's leadership can speak to us with more candor than the last administration under Ronald Reagan a former Hollywood actor. We live in a highly manipulated world. Ideas are manipulated through purposeful distortions in the press and selective omissions in our all-pervasive all public education indoctrination systems. Economic and political realities are falsified by self-serving establishment controllers and their minions in the bureaucracy. Our society is controlled by an aristocracy, a small elite group of individuals who, through control of the government, have obtained special privileges in law and are thus able to live as parasites off the labor of others, mostly the hard-working American middle class and amass large amounts of unearned wealth. This current aristocracy operates covertly and by deceit. The bankers are the main but not the only element in this covert aristocracy. Using many of the standard principles of aristocracy, authoritarianism, statism, 
and the use of intellectual priesthood to deceive the public. They have created a social system where robbery and exploitation are syst systemized and legalized and where resistance to the robber has been made a crime. It is not the function of our government to keep the citizen from falling into error. It is the function of the citizen to keep the government from falling into error. U.S. Supreme Court. <clears throat> now is the time. Okay, it is done. Colonel James Gritz is now officially announced as running for the office of President of the United States of America. He is announced under the shelter of the Populist Party, which, like all organized political operations, has many and varied flaws. Do not let this deter you from your duty as an American to get this man elected to office so that the flaws can be eliminated. You need votes and support. You need unification, for there is no difference whatsoever in the Democratic and Republican parties. In fact, all will now be done to pull down a dictatorship on you, the nation, prior to the 92 election, so that there will not be an election. It is up to you. I am informed that America West will be offering backing and high visibility integration with the effort to elect Colonel Gritz, and I shall do everything allowed to see to it that he is elected, for he is chosen of God for the task. I have quite a bit of pull, but if you the people do not support this in a massive manner, why would you expect God to do it for you? I guarantee that I have a very nice and totally workable relationship with this man, which is blogging the oh, which is boggling the minds of the UFO conspirators. I suggest that if you have ones in the little gray alien with Cooper conspiracy that you alert them. There are heinous things planned by the disinformers to terrify America and parts of the world to finish pulling you into captivity against a common enemy. Your enemies sit in the leadership of your nations and within the banks. There are no enemies in space. What you will be given as proof is a worse lie than any they have conjured thus far and only knowledge of truth can keep you from falling for the trap. Let me say something to you as a people of world citizenship. You are in the sorting of God's people from the ones who wish to follow this evil empire. We are now dealing with God's adversaries who is restricted to the mortal physical plane. The intent is to take the planet Earth, Sham, and then move outward into space. It will not be allowed and there will be a massive effort to hold the beings of Earth hostage. Well, sorry about this, Earth man. God does not compromise, nor does he negotiate. You each will be either on one side or the other, and to not make a decision is to already have made one. All manner of terrible things are in the planning by the deceivers to, to perpetrate upon you in the guise of it being space brothers. No, but you will buy the tale in great masses. However, if you the people of the United States of America fail to fall for the lie, you will prevail and the world shall be turned about, for God will work with you if your intent is truth and honor. He will not do it for you. If your intent remains to continue the breaking of every law of God and the creation, you are responsible for that which comes upon you, and it shall come upon you in a most devastating manner, for we will only airlift out God's people. We have no authority to remove any who practice evil, for those ones are not welcome in the balanced societies of the cosmos. So be it. If you turn around the government of the U.S., the chosen people in place of God, you can reclaim your planet. What else do you have to do with even a tenth as much wondrous challenge and excitement? You are a bored and sleepy civilization, 
Stop watching the play on your pretend screens and get into the game, dear friends. God has sent us, his hosts, to play with you. We have no intention of competing with you, for our enemy is the adversary of God, and we need not a three-ring circus. No one shall be coerced or forced. You will be in the choosing. Lawyers, you have lawyers. Oh my, yes you do. However, since you once failed to know anything about your constitution, I get to lay another heavy trip on you. How many amendments do you have? Do you know that it is unconstitutional for a lawyer to be elected to Congress? What does your 13th Amendment say? Well, now it reads, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction, etc. Ah, but not so. That was the 14th Amendment I just cited. The original 13th Amendment reads as follows. If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor, or shall, without the consent of Congress, accept and retain any present pension, office, or emolument of any kind whatever from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States, and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them, or either of them. Thank you, David Dodge, researcher and Alfred Adask, editor, anti Scheister, August 1991. These ones also give you a special vision of the Pledge of Allegiance you might consider. For it says that the original, what the original meant and ceased to be accepted. I pledge allegiance to the Constitution of the United States of America and to the Republic that honors that Constitution, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Missing 13th Amendment, Titles of Nobility and Honor. In the winter of 1983, archival research expert David Dodge and former Baltimore police investigator Tom Dunn were searching for evidence of government corruption in public records stored in the Belfast Library on the coast of Maine. By chance, I think not, they discovered the library's oldest authentic copy of the Constitution of the United States, printed in 1825. Both men were stunned to see this document included a 13th Amendment that no longer appears on current copies of the Constitution. Moreover, after studying the amendment's language and historical context, they realized the principal intent of this missing 13th Amendment was to prohibit lawyers from serving in government. So began a seven-year nationwide search for the truth surrounding the most bizarre constitutional puzzle in American history, the unlawful removal of a ratified amendment from the Constitution of the United States. Since 1983, Dodge and Dunn have uncovered additional copies of the Constitution with the missing 13th Amendment printed in at least 18 separate publications by 10 different states and territories over four decades from 1822 to 1860. In June of this year, 1991, Dodge uncovered the evidence that this missing 13th Amendment had indeed been lawfully ratified by the state of Virginia and was therefore an authentic amendment to the American Constitution. The evidence is correct and no errors are found. A 13th Amendment restricting lawyers from serving in government was ratified in 1819 and removed from your Constitution during the tumult of the Civil War, deliberately. <laughs> Since the amendment was never lawfully repealed, 
It is still the law today. Wouldn't you now guess that the implications are enormous? The story of this missing amendment is complex and at times confusing because the political issues and vocabulary of the American Revolution were different from your own. However, there are essentially two issues. What does the amendment mean? And was the amendment ratified? Let's look first at the meaning. Meaning. The missing 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States reads as above cited. At first reading, the meaning of this 13th Amendment, also called the Title of Nobility Amendment, seems a bit obscure, unimportant. The references to nobility, honor, emperor, king, and prince lead you to dismiss this amendment as a pretty post-revolution act of spite directed against the British monarchy. But in your modern world of Lady D and oh Lady Di and Prince Charles, anti-royalist sentiments seem so archaic and quaint that the am amendment can be ignored. Not so. Consider some real hard evidence of its historical significance. First, titles of nobility were prohibited in both Article Six of the of the Articles of Confederation in 1777 and in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution of the United States, 1788. Second, although already prohibited by the Constitution, an additional Title of Nobility Amendment was proposed in 1789, again in 1810, and was finally ratified in 1819. Clearly, the Founding Fathers saw such a serious threat in titles of nobility and honors that anyone receiving them would forfeit their citizenship. How about Sir Schwarzkopf and Sir Dr. Kissinger? Since the government prohibited titles of nobility several times over four decades and went through the amending process, even though titles of nobility were already prohibited by the Constitution, it's obvious that the amendment carried much more significance for your founding fathers than is readily apparent to you today. Historical Context To understand the meaning of this missing 13th Amendment, you must understand its historical context. The era surrounding the American Revolution, which of course, you are not taught. You tend to regard the notion of democracy as benign, harmless, and politically unremarkable. But at the time of the American Revolution, King George III and the other monarchies of Europe saw democracy as an unnatural, ungodly ideological threat, every bit as dangerously radical as communism. <laughs> so the obvious solution was to turn democracy and communism into a method of creating what they wanted in the first place, a monarchy dictatorship, while calling it nice labels. Just as the 1917 communist revolution in Russia financed by you nice people, by nice people's bankers, just as the so-called Soviet revolution this week is sponsored and financed by the same nice people in your behalf, spawned other revolutions around the world. The American Revolution provided an example and incentive for people all over the world to overthrow their European monarchies, or so it was interpreted. Even though the Treaty of Paris ended the Revolutionary War in 1783, the simple fact of your existence threatened the monarchies. The United States stood as a heroic role model for other nations that inspired them to also struggle against oppressive monarchies. The French Revolution, 1789 and 1799, and the Polish national uprising in 1794 were in part encouraged by the American Revolution. Though you stood like a beacon of hope for the most of the world, 
the monarchies regarded the United States as a political typhoid Mary, the principal source of radical democracy that was destroying monarchies around the world. The monarchies must have realized that if the principal source of that infection could be destroyed, the rest of the world might avoid the contagion and the monarchies would be saved. Their survival at stake, the monarchies sought to destroy or subvert the American system of government. Knowing they couldn't destroy you militarily, they resorted to more covert methods of political subversion, employing spies and secret agents skilled in bribery and legal deception. It was, perhaps, the first Cold War. Since governments run on money, politicians run for money, and money is usual is the usual enticement to commit treason. Much of the monarchy's counter-revolutionary efforts emanated from English banks. Don't bank on it. The essence of banking was once explained by Sir Josiah Stamp, a former president of the Bank of England. I have given this before, but it is such a dandy I shall repeat it. The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth, take it away from them, but leave them the power to create money. And, with a flick of a pen, they will create enough money to buy it back again. Take this great power away from them, and all great fortunes like mine will disappear, and they ought to disappear, for then this would be a better and happier world to live in. But if you want to continue to be the slaves of bankers, and pay the cost of your own slavery, then let bankers continue to create money and control credit. One of the past great abuses of your banking system, caused by the depression of the 1930s. Today's abuses are causing another and more massive depression than the world has ever known. Current SNL bank scandals illustrate the ongoing relationships between banks, lawyers, politicians, and government agencies. Look at the current BCCI and BNL scandals running from high government officers to the presidency itself involved in totally criminal activities, such as the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and even the CIA. These scandals are the direct result of years of law-breaking by an alliance of bakers, bankers and lawyers using their influence and money to corrupt the political process and rob the public. Think you're not being robbed? Guess who's going to pay the bill for the excesses of these bailouts? As Oberly and Dharma track further and deeper into involved parties attached to this present properly, property scam scandal, they are finding other financial institutions involved, and, as named in the investigation, find Salomon find Solomon Brothers and their financial institutions who are kaput and haven't even been made public. No wonder the FDIC and RTC are asking additional billions. The systematic robbery of productive individuals by parasitic bankers and lawyers is not a recent phenomenon. This abuse is a human tradition that predates the Bible and spread from Europe to America despite early colonial prohibitions. Remember the Protocols of Zion? Try the issue of October 1920, number 13. We have already established our own men in all important positions. We must endeavor to provide the Goyim, non-Jews and including Judeans, Hebrews, with lawyers and doctors. The lawyers are al Qurant with all interest. And 14. But above all, let us monopolize education. By this means, we spread ideas that are useful to us and shape the children's brains as suit us. And then 15. 
If one of our people should unhappily fall into the hands of justice amongst the Christians, we must rush to help him, find as many witnesses as he needs to save him from his judges until we become judges ourselves. It is about time to again publish the protocols, friends, but I have quite a bit of additional updating to do prior to that, so let us hold up herein and not get sidetracked from the missing 13th Amendment. It is all tied in together, as you might have guessed by now. You may as well consider that there is a total integration of the Protocols of Zion, the Crimu Manifesto, and the Epistle emanating from the Prince of the Jews. Isn't it interesting that these were published in a Rothschild magazine? The Prince of the Jews was done in 1489 AD. But then, who would ever think, most especially Gentiles, of connecting these things with other documents emanating from Jewry or with modern happenings? So be it. When the first United States bank was chartered by Congress in, in 1790, there were only three state banks in existence. At one time, banks were prohibited by law in most states because many of the early settlers were all too familiar with the practices of the European goldsmith banks. Goldsmith banks were safe houses used to store clients' gold. In exchange for the deposited gold, customers were issued notes paper money, which were, redeemed, which were redeemable in gold. The goldsmith bankers quickly succumbed to the temptation to issue extra notes unbacked by gold. Why? Because the extra notes enriched the bankers by allowing them to buy property with notes for gold that they did not even own, gold that did not even exist. Colonists knew that bankers occasionally printed too much paper money found themselves over-leveraged, and caused a run on the bank. If the bankers lacked sufficient gold to meet the demand, the paper money became worthless and common citizens left holding the paper were ruined. Although over-leveraged bankers were sometime hung, the bankers continued printing extra money to increase their fortunes at the expense of the productive members of society. The practice continues to this day and offers sweetheart loans to bank insiders and even provides the foundation for deficit spending and your federal government's unbridled growth. Paper money. If the colonists forgot the lessons of goldsmith bankers, the American Revolution refreshed their memories. To finance the war, Congress authorized the printing of continental bills of credit in an amount not to exceed two hundred million thousand dollars or two hundred million dollars, the states issued another two hundred million dollars in paper notes. Ultimately, the value of the paper money fell so low that they were soon traded in on speculation from five hundred to one thousand paper bills for one coin. It's then suggested that your Constitution's prohibition against paper economy, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, was a tool of the wealthy to be worked to the disadvantage of all others. But only in a paper economy can money reproduce itself and increase the claims of the wealthy at the expense of the productive. Paper money, said Palatia Webster, polluted the equity of our laws, turned them into engines of oppression, corrupted the justice of our public administration, destroyed the fortunes of thousands who had confidence in it, enervated the trade, husbandry, and man manufacturers of our country, and went far to destroy the morality of our people. Conspiracies. Be patient. It may seem that I am not on the same subject, but I am. A few examples of the attempts by the monarchies and banks that almost succeeded in destroying the United States. 
According to the Tennessee Laws, 1715-1820, Volume 2, page 774, in the 1794 Jay Treaty, the United States agreed to pay 600,000 pounds sterling to King George III as reparations for the American Revolution. Interesting? The Senate ratified the treaty in secret session and ordered that it not be published. When Benjamin Franklin's grandson published it anyway, the exposure and resulting public uproar so angered the Congress that it passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, 1798, so federal judges could prosecute editors and publishers for reporting the truth about the government. Since you had won the Revolutionary War, why would your senators agree to pay reparations to the loser? And why would they agree to pay 600,000 pounds sterling 11 years after the war ended? It just doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Especially unless you assume, oh, especially in light of the Senate's secrecy and later fury over being exposed, unless you assume your senators had been bribed to serve the British monarchy and betray the American people, that, dear ones, is subversion. The United States Bank had been opposed by the Jeffersonians from the beginning, but the Federalists, the pro-monarchy party, won out in its establishment. The initial capitalization was 10 million, 80% of which would be owned by foreign bankers. Since the bank was authorized to lend up to 20 million, double its paid in capital, it was a profitable deal for both the government and the bankers since they could lend and collect interest usury on $10 million that did not exist. However, the European bankers outfoxed the government and by 1796 the government owed the bank $6,200,000 and was forced to sell its shares. By 1802, your government owned no stock in the United States Bank. The sheer power of the banks and their ability to influence representative government by economic manipulation and outright bribery was exposed in 1811. When the people discovered that European banking interests owned 80% of the bank, Congress therefore refused to renew the bank's charter. This led to the withdrawal of $7 million in specie, in specie by European investors, which in turn precipitated an economic recession and the War of 1812. There are other examples of the monarchy's efforts to subvert or destroy the United States. Some are common knowledge. Others remain to be disclosed to the public. There is, for example, a book called Two VA Law in the Library of Congress Law Library. This is an uncatalogued uncatalog book in the rare book section that reveals a plan to overthrow the constitutional government by secret agreements engineered by the lawyers. That, dear ones, is one reason that the 13th Amendment was ratified by Virginia and the notification lost in the mail. There is no public record of this book's existence. Does this sound surprising? Perish the thought of surprising. The Library of Congress has over 349,402 uncatalogued rare books and 13.9 million uncatalogued rare manuscripts, laws, and ratifications. There are secrets buried in that mass of documents even more astonishing than a missing constitutional amendment. I can well assure you. Titles of Nobility In seeking to rule the world and destroy the United States, bankers committed many crimes. Foremost among these crimes were fraud, conversion, and plain old theft. To escape prosecution for their crimes, the bankers did the same thing any career criminal does. They hired and formed alliances with the best lawyers and judges money could buy. These alliances, originally forged in Europe, particularly in Great Britain, 
spread to the colonies and later into the newly formed United States of America. Just as with Dharma and Oberly's legal case, the adversary lawyer, Mr. Horn, simply removes any papers from the file which can aid and assist the defendants. When discovered, he then threatens all sorts of heinous consequences if his trick is revealed. What is this man's name? I thought you would never ask. It is spelled Stephen Horn. S-T-E-V-E-N-H-O-R-N. One of his threats is to get them if this incident is revealed in any of this so-called Dharma's writings. Well, old buddy, they have nothing to lose, but I do suggest that Mr. Horn does. Remember the part of the protocols about providing witness, uh, witnesses sufficient to win your case? Well, he did that too, but he outsmarted himself. The first hearing came with sufficient provided witnesses to swamp the court with liars. But he had presented a backup case petition, which caused the judge to disallow further proceedings at that time. So, along with the presentation of the city clerk and city treasurer as defendants' witnesses, the liars did panic and disappear. How handy, though, our attorneys have turned up one or two of them, and we shall see how well they like lying now. Despite their criminal foundation, these alliances forged in Europe generated wealth and ultimately respectability. Like any modern unit of organized crime, English bankers and lawyers wanted to be admired as legitimate businessmen. As their criminal fortunes grew, so did their usefulness, so the British monarchy legitimized these thieves by granting them titles of nobility. Historically, the British peerage system referred to as knights, oh, referred to knights as squires and to those who bore the knight's shields as esquires. Isn't this fun? As lances, shields, and physical violence gave way to more civilized means of theft, the pen grew mightier and far more profitable than the sword, and the clever wielders of those pens, bankers and lawyers, came to hold titles of nobility. The most common title was esquire, used even today by lawyers. International Bar Association. In colonial America, attorneys trained attorneys, but most held no title of nobility or honor. There was no requirement that one be a lawyer to hold the position of district attorney, attorney general, or judge. A citizen's council of choice was not restricted to a lawyer. There were no state or national bar associations. The only organization that certified lawyers was the International Bar Association, IBA, chartered by the King of England, headquartered in London, and closely associated with the international banking system. Lawyers admitted to the IBA received the rank Esquire, a title of nobility. Esquire was the principal title of nobility which the 13th Amendment sought to prohibit from the United States. Why? Because the loyalty of Esquire lawyers was suspect. Bankers and lawyers with an Esquire behind their names were agents of the monarchy, members of an organization whose principal purposes were political, not economic and regarded with the same wariness that some people today reserve for members of the KGB, or the CIA. Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution sought to prohibit the International Bar Association, or any other agency that granted titles of nobility, from operating in America. But the Constitution neglected to specify a penalty, so the prohibition was ignored, and agents of the monarchy continued to infiltrate and influence the government, as in the Jay Treaty and the U.S. Bank Charter incidents. Therefore, a title of nobility amendment that specified a penalty, loss of citizenship, was proposed in 1789 and again in 18, 
and 1810. The meaning of the amendment is seen in its intent to prohibit persons having titles of nobility and loyalties to foreign governments and bankers from voting, holding public office, or using their skills to subvert the government. Honor. The missing amendment is referred to as the Title of Nobility Amendment, but the second prohibition against honor may be more significant. The archaic definition of honor, as used w when the 13th Amendment was ratified, meant anyone obtaining or having an advantage or privilege over another. A contemporary example of an honor granted to only a few Americans is the privilege of being a judge. Lawyers can be judges and exercise the amendment privileges, oh, the attendant privileges and powers. Non-lawyers cannot. By prohibiting honors, the missing 14th Amendment prohibits any advantage or privilege that would grant some citizens an unequal opportunity to achieve or exercise political power. Therefore, the second meaning intent of the 13th Amendment is to ensure political equality among all American citizens by prohibiting anyone, even government officials, from claiming or exercising a special privilege or power, an honor, over other citizens. This interpretation is quite true, little ones, and would be the key concept in the 13th Amendment. Why? Because while titles of nobility may no longer apply in today's political system, the concept of honor remains relevant. For example, anyone who had a specific immunity from lawsuits which were not afforded to all citizens would be enjoying a separate privilege, an honor, and would therefore forfeit his right to vote or hold public office. Think of the immunities from lawsuits that your judges, lawyers, politicians, and bureaucrats currently enjoy. As another example, think of all the special interest legislation your government passes. Special interests are simply euphemisms for special privileges. Honors. What if? If the missing 13th Amendment were to be restored, special interests and immunities would be rendered unconstitutional. The prohibition against honors, privileges, would compel the entire government to operate under the same laws as the citizens of your nation. Without their current personal immunities, honors, your judges and IRS agents would be unable to abuse common citizens without fear of legal liability. If the 13th Amendment were restored, your entire government would have no, would have to conduct itself would have to conduct itself according to the same standards of decency, respect, law, and liability as the rest of the nation. If this amendment and the term honor were applied today, your government's ability to systematically coerce and abuse the public would be all but eliminated. Just imagine can you imagine a government without special privileges or immunities? How could you even describe it? It would be almost like a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Could it, be, could it possibly be that the Founding Fathers intended it to be that way? Imagine a government whose members were truly accountable to the public. A government that could not systematically exploit its own people. It's unheard of for it got deliberately undone before it could be done. It has never been done before, and you thought a poor soul called Benedict Arnold was a traitor. You have never had a constitutional government as intended, not ever in the entire history of the world. So here comes the argument. Senator George Mitchell of Maine and the National Archives concede this 13th Amendment was proposed by Congress in 1810. However, they explain that there were 17 states when Congress proposed the Title of Nobility Amendment that ratification required the support of 13 states, but since only 12 states supported the amendment, it was not ratified. 
The government printing office hops on the bandwagon to agree. It currently prints copies of the Constitution of the United States, which include the Title of Nobility Amendment as proposed, but unratified. Even if this 13th Amendment was never ratified, even if research would be flawed and only 12 states voted to ratify the amendment, wouldn't the possibility be wondrous to imagine? So what am I saying? Am I saying that it was a dream within one vote of historical utopia? No, I am saying that it was ratified. After a break, we shall continue to prove it. And dear ones of America, and ones running for office with overwhelming odds against house cleaning, here are your tools to do the sweeping. Now do you see the value of a good old space cadet with x-ray vision? It surely doesn't surprise any of you that this particular amendment would get lost. So be it.